All right, everyone, welcome back to another video. In this video, we are going to talk about predicting the difficult airway. Now, the first thing I need to start by saying is that there is no perfect tool for predicting the difficult airway, that we should always be ready in emergency uh, 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 airway management to be able to manage a difficult airway that we might not anticipate. There are some tools, uh, some of which have more research behind them and some of them uh, as not as much, but still uh, experts would recommend that they are useful. Uh, and we're gonna walk through that. Now, it's important for us to realize the difficult airway, and you probably know this, is on a spectrum from the impossible airway where we may not be able to bag valve mask or intubate or be able to get adequate chest rise and fall with an extra glottic or maybe not even do a surgical airway uh, to the very easy airway. Now, one thing that is very evident uh, in the literature, as you dig in a little bit, uh, is that upper airway obstruction, it makes most airway uh, things more difficult. So if you were to say, what is the most difficult aspect or the most concerning aspect uh, when we walk up to a patient and look at them is say, do they have upper airway obstruction? Now patients with upper airway obstruction uh, have a history, could have a history of sleep apnea, uh, obesity, third trimester pregnancy, uh, definitely swelling or strider, uh, any swelling in the airway or uh, swelling specifically around uh, the glottic opening and strider. Uh, patients that have difficulty swallowing or hoarse voice, but in the presence of shortness of breath. Um, so you've all had lost your voice at some point, the difference being that you weren't short of breath at the same time. If we have a patient with a raspy, hot potato voice uh, and is short of breath, that is very concerning. Uh, so upper airway obstruction is where the majority of the problems are. And I want you to remember that as we walk through each of these uh, difficulties that we're gonna talk through. Now, uh, we're gonna walk through, uh, and there, there are patients uh, that uh, if we had uh, upper airway obstruction, that we'd like to avoid having to take on their airway any further than what we're already doing if it's working. So if you have a morbidly obese patient that you're currently ventilating with a bag valve mask, uh, then we're just going to be transporting off to the anesthesiologist uh, to figure out uh, how to manage their airway in a more definitive way if at all possible. So if we're oxygen, remembering that oxygenation and ventilation is the key uh, to successful emergency airway management. Uh, and obviously we are interested in protecting the airway and we can do that through basic maneuvers of sending patient up a bit, intermittent suctioning and, and being ready uh, to roll the patient if we have any kind of vomiting or anything of that nature. Um, there are patients additionally, besides the upper airway obstruction, that can't handle apneic periods. Uh, so whether that's a patient that you're having difficulty pre-oxygenating or uh, a patient uh, that has severe metabolic acidosis, uh, for example, maybe they're a DKA or a septic patient, uh, those patients desaturate very quickly. Uh, obese or uh, children also uh, de uh, uh, desaturate uh, quickly and obviously ill patients uh, desaturate quickly. So as we're turning our attention to airway, I just wanted to remind you that the key is adequate oxygenation and ventilation by whatever tool. And we don't wanna put a patient at risk. And that is why we do airway assessments is to uh, figure out, do we think it is likely that we're gonna be successful? Uh, and that's probably the most important question you can answer as you're using airway assessments. Is intubation gonna be successful? And if intubation's not successful, do I anticipate a bag valve mask being successful? or an extra glottic being successful, because we'd like to avoid having to go to a surgical airway, although there are some cases that that is necessary. But if this is a case that we can avoid that, then doing these airway assessments that go, oh, this looks like a really difficult intubation, then we can delay till we have the expert uh, in the room and also more airway tools around uh, in managing this patient. So it's really important that we understand uh, and are able to anticipate, although not a perfect tool, is suggestive uh, that uh, it, we could maybe anticipate difficulties we could encounter uh, and thus protect uh, our patient from uh, any risk from that. Now, uh, there are two kind of main acronyms that get used. Uh, Ron Walls uh, uses a Roman for difficult bag valve mask, rods for extraglottic, uh, and SMART uh, for 
uh, difficult uh, cricothyroidotomy. Um, uh, and George Kovach uh, has his, uh, which regionally we hear more of. So we're going to be covering uh, George Kovach's versions. Uh, they both utilize lemon, which is of the airway assessment tools that we could use is the most research uh, invalidated approach uh, as we walk in. But it's very important for us to know that when we have a difficulty, our difficult airway patient, like upper airway obstruction, that things tend to all fall. Uh, so if you have a difficult bag valve mask, likely that patient is difficult to do extraglottic and likely difficult intubation. Uh, particularly difficult bag valve mask, uh, now, as far as how often that happens, you know, nowhere, it's about one out of 50 patients uh, uh, that encounter some difficulty. And one in 600 uh, patients are actually impossible to bag valve mask. Um, a difficult bag valve mask um, uh, uh, is in one third of patients that if there's intubation failure, so if you go in and assess uh, or can't intubate a patient, up to one third of those patients are actually difficult to bag valve mask. And if you have difficulty um, in bag valve mask, it's four times more likely that you're going to have difficult intubation. And the likelihood of impossible intubation if you're experiencing difficult bag valve mask is actually 12 times more high, um, so more likely. So it's uh, really important for us to realize that these airway uh, uh, skills kind of uh, involving the upper airway are all kind of linked. Uh, the bag valve mask, extraglottic, uh, and intubation all involve uh, passages through getting things through uh, the upper airway. So uh, to be aware of that. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, I'm going to start off with predicting difficult bag valve mask. Um, so uh, George Kovach uh, uses the acronym BOOTS. Uh, so uh, for beard, uh, we could also think of other uh, mask seal issues. Uh, additionally, I'd say uh, if you have a high melon patty, which we'll talk about, or a patient that's male is more likely to be difficult uh, for bag valve masking than a female patient. O is for obesity and obstruction, and I want to re-emphasize uh, re, uh, re uh, that obesity, third trimester pregnancy, strider, difficulty swallowing, a muffled voice in the presence of dyspnea, all really concerning. Uh, any kind of history of sleep apnea, uh, any uh, edema or masses in the airway. And important for us to know that with obesity obstruction, we're not talking about foreign body. Now, foreign body airway obstruction is a separate thing, but we're talking about tissue that is swollen or enlarged or just uh, disproportionate to other structures and that can't be removed in an emergency setting so you kind of have to make do with it um, so it's intrinsic tissue uh, that we're talking about as far as obstruction here and in all of our airway assessments uh, the next goal is for older patients uh, patients greater than uh, 55 are more difficult to ventilate uh, than younger patients Toothless, uh, which goes back to our uh, our beard, but also creates mass seal. So if you don't have dentures in and we're caved in, uh, finding dentures is very useful uh, to build structure to be able to seal that mass too. Uh, and then any sounds, both in the upper airway, we've talked about snoring or strider, uh, but also in the lower airways, if we have wheezing or, uh, or rails or crackles, uh, those are associated with difficulties in bag valve mass. Now onto difficult extraglottic. Uh, we have uh, moods, so mouth opening is the first. So typically when we're thinking about uh, patients' airway and mouth opening, we'd like them to be able to fit the, uh, their three fingers into the mouth. Now, if they have an altered level of consciousness, you're just going to compare your fingers to theirs and be able to assess, could I get three of their fingers in their mouth? Um, next would be uh, obstruction pathologies uh, at or below of the vocal cords, which we can hear kind of thoughts of, poor, like if we had wheezes uh, uh, in the lower airways or strider in the upper airways. Displacement or distortion or disruption of the upper airway anatomy, so any kind of trauma or tumors or mass in the upper airway. Uh, and then stiff lungs uh, or stiff chest wall if we had a burnt patient and we didn't have good chest rise and fall because of the burn. That would be an example uh, as we're walking through the. And, and next, we're going to walk on from di to difficult cricothyroidotomy. 
Um, and I would say of the predicting for difficult cricket throat anatomy, I think the most important is can you put your finger on the spot? In males, it's easier to trace down from the jaw, palpating down the front of the neck and find their Adam's apple, that thyroid cartilage, which is the first big prominence. Next bump down uh, is the cricoid cartilage. Space in between is the cricothyroid membrane. In females, starting from the sternal notch and palpating up uh, until you find the most prominent cartilage, which would be the cricoid cartilage. We should feel it go wide above that cricoid cartilage as the thyroid cartilage uh, kind of uh, extends out a bit laterally. Um, so as far as the actual acronym, the first is uh, uh, D is for distorted uh, overlying anatomy, and that can be from blood trauma or hematoma or infection. But once again, it gets away, it gets in the way of being able to access and find, which is the next thing, A is for access, is can you put your finger on the spot? Uh, if we had obesity uh, or the inability to extend a patient's head or neck, um, uh, that would make that more difficult. Uh, R is for radiation uh, therapy to the neck. So as, uh, if there's been radiation therapy to the neck, uh, those tissue planes change and they adhere to each other. So you can think of skin being stuck on cartilage. And during a surgical airway uh, procedure, uh, in emergency cricothyroidotomy, most of us are using a technique where we're cutting down and spreading the tissue and trying to find the cricothyroid membrane before we go in. So if we can't spread those tissues apart, that makes it more difficult. And the last would be T would be for tumor, uh, which could be external or internal, uh, would cause problems. Now, now we're gonna talk about lemon, which uh, both airway experts recommend uh, is by, by far the most utilized and research air, uh, airway assessment tools for difficult laryngoscopy. Now, uh, direct laryng this was originally used for direct laryngoscopy, uh, and as video laryngoscopy has emerged, uh, we're seeing aspects of it uh, that there's some overlap between the two. It's not perfect, it's not the perfect tool for video laryngoscopy, uh, but video laryngoscopy is just emerging in emergency medicine. And that was uh, essentially should be used according to the literature as the first pass uh, uh, attempt uh, for uh, the first attempt for most intubations. Um, so we're gonna walk through lemon and then I'll uh, try to remember to tell you the ones uh, that uh, have some, uh, some uh, there's some evidence that points towards uh, that would cause difficulty in video. So with lemon, we have look externally, and this is kind of a gestalt. When we look, if we have a short neck, uh, a, 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 a sternal mental distance of greater uh, less than 12 centimeters, so short neck, uh, a large uh, neck diameter, um, uh, or kind of any abnormal uh, anatomy. This could be a large uh, overbite. Uh, this could, uh, or, or underbite, this could also be uh, a narrow face, a really narrow face. Uh, could also be trauma to the airway. So kind of a gestalt when you walk up to the patient, do they look difficult to intubate based on your experience intubating patients? Uh, e is for evaluate, uh, three, uh, uh, three uh, two, one. Uh, so the first three, as we've already talked about, is the size of the mouth opening, comparing the patient size, so they should, patients should be able to fit three fingers. So if they're conscious, it's open their mouth, can they put three fingers? If not, you're going to compare your fingers to theirs. So three of their fingers uh, is room to work. Uh, three fingers uh, of your uh, thyromental distance, and this is how long is your jaw? Uh, this is the space we're going to displace the tongue into, uh, and, and this uh, will become important. So we would like them to be long, uh, additionally wide. We don't typically measure wide, but uh, we'd like that is the space we're going to displace the tongue to. So if we have more room to put the tongue into, then it gets more out of your way. Um, the next is two fingers down from your hyoid bone uh, down to uh, the top of your Adam's apple, your thyroid cartilage. Uh, and that would be ideal as two fingers down. Next would be uh, jaw protrusion. Uh, is the, can, I, can I sublux my jaw? Can I bite my upper lip? It is an upper lip bite test. Uh, it has been well researched. But uh, if not, if the patient's unconscious, can we just sublux their jaw? Can we get one of their fingers uh, between their teeth as we extend that lower jaw past the upper uh, teeth? Um, so uh, that is uh, our evaluate. Now on to Malin Patty. Now Malin Patty is a comparison is telling us the size of the tongue 
compared to the size of the oral pharynx. Um, so if you have a big tongue and a small mouth, then it's hard to get around that tongue uh, because you don't have much room for it. So, uh, so if you have a big tongue and a small mouth, you're going to have like a, a more of a grade four malampati. Uh, whereas if you have a proportionately small tongue and large mouth, uh, then you would have a grade one malampati, which would be associated with easier intubations. Now, in a grade one view, when the patients sit forward and go, ah, and stick out their tongue, you can see their, all of their soft palate down to their uvula, the fossas and pillars. Um, whereas in, uh, if we go to grade two, you lose a bit of that view. You can still see all the soft palate, the uvula, and the fossas. Uh, but then in grade three, you can't see the base of the uvula. Uh, above the patient's tongue. And grade four, all you can see when they sit forward and go, ah, uh, and phonate is important with this, is just hard palate. You can't see uh, that little punching bag in the back of your throat uh, known as your uvula. Um, now, if our patient's not conscious and can't uh, lean forward and go, ah, uh, a, a quick look uh, if they're unconscious of lifting their tongue and jaw and saying, can I see structures? Or using your uh, laryngoscope as a tongue depressor and say, can I see structures at the back of the throat? Because what we're trying to compare is size of mouth to size of tongue. Um, so you can get a gestalt of that. Now, much better for the patient to sit forward and go, ah, that is true malampetti. But I'm just saying there is information we can gain even in the altered level of consciousness patient. Uh, the O is for uh, the obstruction, which we've been talking about, whether that be upper airway obstruction or uh, which would accompany with obesity, any edema, any masses, third trimester pregnancy, strider, all of those things. The last is neck mobility. Can we put the patient in a sniffing position? So auditory meatus uh, to a sternal notch. So ear to sternum is ideal location to align airway axes so it's easier for you to make a straight path from above the patient's uh, a, a most superior uh, teeth uh, through to, uh, or their incisors, through to uh, their glottic opening. We're trying to create a straight path. And if you uh, put a patient in a sniffing position, that is the ideal location. In EMS, I do hear of this padding under the shoulders as being a good idea. That would be a good idea in an uh, infant or a child, you still want the same goal, ear hole in line with sternum. Uh, so infants have big bobble heads, uh, and us, then you'd have to pad their shoulders in order to bring their ear back to the level of the sternum. Um, in adults, we're always gonna have to pad the head uh, to get the ears to the level of the sternum. Um, so as far as difficult video laryngoscopy, what is known uh, that I was able to find, and I'm sure there's others emerging, was large neck mobility, large uh, neck circumference, or any kind of unusual anatomy overbites uh, is associated. Less than three fingers mouth opening, less than one finger of, uh, the, uh, of the jaw protrusion or the inability to do the upper lip uh, bite test. Uh, a malampati uh, that would be more on the forend, uh, any obesity obstruction, uh, and then difficulties in neck mobility or abnormal neck anatomy, uh, including kind of scars, radiation, or anything inside the throat that changes that anatomy. Uh, and I'm sure there will be tools that will emerge that will become more clear around video uh, laryngoscopy. Now, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of a feel of how common are you likely to run into difficult oxygenation? Oh, sorry, difficult uh, airway characteristics. Where did oxygenation come from? I guess that's the goal. But difficult airway characteristics. So uh, as far as difficult intubation, we talked a little bit the occurrence uh, of difficult bag valve mess. Let's talk about uh, difficult intubation. So in an OR is where we get most of our literature around uh, patients. Uh, in intubation success rate. So less than 1% uh, uh, of patients that present for general anesthesia uh, end up with a grade four uh, laryngoscopy where you can't see the epiglottis, that you can't see any of the airway structures. 
uh, for grade three, where you can just see the epiglottis as you work your way down the tongue, but none of the cartilage or the glottic opening, uh, that uh, it still represents a, a high difficulty in intubation. And that's less than kind of uh, less than 5% of the patients. Grade two uh, is 10 to 30%. Now, what we have found, originally we talked about these as grade two, and now we talk about 2A and 2B. Now, the easy way for you to remember is 2A uh, is that you can see part of the vocal cords. So you can think of A, I got an A in my paper, that's better than a B. Uh, so grade A is that you can see the vocal cords are part of the vocal cords. If you could see the entirety of the vocal cords, that would be a grade one view. So a 2A, uh, it, it ends up being 80% uh, of, the, of the grade two um, views that you're going to see. Uh, and essentially, a less than one in 20 cases are unable to be intubated. So a 2A, one out of 20 results in can't intubate this patient. Uh, in a 2B, where all you see, you don't see any vocal cords, all you see is epiglottis and then a retinoid cartilage, in that patient, that is accompanied with a two thirds of those patients end up that we have a failure to intubate. Um, now, is that failure one time or failure? Depends on the literature you're looking at, whether it's an uh, inability to intubate or if that's just a failed intubation attempt, uh, but definitely we'd be predictive. And then grade one, virtually 100% success rate uh, for intubation, if you can uh, see those. So that's, those are, as far as the stats around we're gonna see, uh, is that less than 1% of the population is gonna create uh, that grade four view, 5% uh, is gonna be grade three, uh, and then uh, grade two is 10 to 30% of the population, with the remaining population being a grade one view. Now, there is much more reports in case reports and reviews of case reports in emergency medicine of uh, up to 10% were considered difficult intubation. And what they uh, determined uh, by difficult intubation would be a grade uh, three or four Cormac Lehane view where you could only see the epiglottis or couldn't see epiglottis or any airway structures or more than three attempts uh, at intubation were required. Uh, and as you increase the amount of attempts, success rates tend to go down. Uh, so many uh, EMS systems limit intubation attempts to three uh, attempts maximum and like you to be progressing through different approaches. Um, so that gives us a little bit of a feel uh, of difficult, uh, uh, predicting difficulty in the airway. Remind you, there is no perfect tool. So when we're undergoing any emergency airway, we should be ready to integrate all of the airway tools that we have available if necessary. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Until next time, uh, we uh, will chat then.